Welcome to Pedagogy of Hope, hosted by Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity, or Branch Ed. My name is Kim Igwe, and I am the Professional Learning Associate in the Birch Center here at Branch Ed. Thanks for joining us today. We're honored to have each of you here today. I know you're eager to hear from Dr. Pogue. We're going to get quick, um, started quickly after my three minute introduction. Please note that we have live captioning is enabled for this webinar. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge the disruption in our lives and increase in traumas caused by the global pandemic and other things that may be weighing heavy on our minds today. Even though we can't see each other in this webinar format, we feel the connection that makes us a community, and that is to make the world a better place through education. With that, I will briefly share the mission of Branch Ed. It is our vision to strengthen, grow, and lift up the impact of educator preparation programs at minority serving institutions as being central to efforts to shift the 20% of national representation of teachers of color to a much greater percentage of a diverse and highly qualified teaching force. In doing so, we can and will ensure America's children receive the best education and support as possible. Today is the third webinar in our 2021 and 2022 webinar series on innovative pedagogies. The intention behind this series is to inspire us all to think about educational practice through lenses which center on and humanize historically underrepresented and excluded learners. Each webinar features a pedagogical expert. Our hope is that you will walk away with an invigorated teaching philosophy and strategies that revolutionize your practice. Today's webinar is on Pedagogy of Hope. Next, we have ELA and Critical Pedagogy by Dr. Amy Myers. These webinars are on the first Wednesday of every month except January. I'll share the link to our events page at the end of today's session. Before handing it over to Dr. Tiffany Pogue, let me briefly introduce her. Dr. Tiffany Pogue is an Associate Professor of Teacher Education, Interim Director of First Year Experience and Program Coordinator of Education Foundations at Albany State University. Her research interests include Black educational history and philosophy, Black literacy traditions, and community school engagement. Tiffany believes that through a critical exploration and examination of history, scholars and activists can collaboratively craft a narrative of hope and plans for the improvement of society. Her current work examines the role of Black women's literacy in the practices of Black spirituality, Black educational activism, and Black cultural preservation. Dr. Tiffany Pogue. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm excited to be with you. Um, if you bear with me just a moment, everyone, I'm gonna share my screen and my slides. And today we'll be talking about um, a pedagogy of hope, which a lot of people link back to Paulo Freire, rightfully. Um, and I'm going to uh, describe the pedagogy a bit, as well as give some classroom implications that we may be able to begin now. And um, I wanted to start with a little bit about me to tell you why a pedagogy of hope is so important. I've put one of my favorite quotes um, by Paulo Freire here on the slide. We need critical hope the way a fish needs unpolluted water. And I think especially now, uh, this is extremely, extremely important. Um, I am a college dropout and I always like to start conversations with people with that in mind. Um, I was a 16-year-old freshman at Florida a and University um, in 1991, and um, I was academically prepared for undergraduate work. I was not socially prepared to be in a setting like FAMU presented to me. And to make a long story short, I did not feel supported um, by many of my faculty, and I dropped out of school. And I spent about 10 years out doing my thing, working, um, trying to make a way for myself and making pretty good money for someone without a college degree. But it got to a point where I was unsatisfied with my life and I felt like there were some things that I needed to do. And I'll never forget that I came home from work one day and there was a documentary on television called A Long and Mighty Walk featuring the historian, Dr. John Henry Clark. 
And Dr. Clark in that documentary uh, recounts the history of Black folk from the beginning of time up until the Million Man March, which was around the time that the documentary is recorded. And I called my father that night and I said, I think I'm ready to go back to school. Now, before that, I had been a public relations major, a psychology major, all of those things. But after watching that documentary, my question became, who teaches young Black kids about their potential? Um, and I felt a pull on myself. And so I enrolled at Fort Valley State University. Um, and much like my students do now, I was struggling to make a full course load and saw a class called Introduction to African World Studies um, that was being taught by someone named Mwali Mushuja. And I registered for the course because, you know, my rationale was I'm black, I can pass that class. Um, so I registered for the course, it was Tuesday nights. And I remember the first night of class, Dr. Shu just said, you know, quite, in his quiet, unassuming way, he said, um, do you work? And I said, no. And he said, oh, okay. Now, I was a little embarrassed to be in that class because I had spent about 10 years out before I made the decision to go back to school. Um, I was embarrassed because I was so much older than the other students. But Dr. Shu just saw something that night. And the very next class meeting, he had a contract. And he said, I want you to come work with me and be my research assistant. Now, that was our former relationship, because, but he became a mentor beyond that. And I don't care what I was doing in my other classes. Whenever he saw me, he would ask me what was going on, what I was learning. And I would tell him, and he would go to his office and come back with arms full of books. And in these books would be, he would say, yes, learn what everyone else is saying about a subject, but never forget that your people write about it too. And he would have all these books by these black authors um, in psychology and history and mathematics and whatever class it was. And I remember thinking to myself, if I ever become a teacher, that's who I want to be. Dr. Schuster probably single-handedly changed the trajectory of my, my life. Because before that, I didn't have a plan. You know, I wanted to finish my degree, um, but I didn't even know what I was supposed to do. When it was time for me to graduate, another educator uh, came to my family's home. They had a, a you know, celebratory fish fry after a graduation. And Dr. Vimbai Chiva Order, who was visiting from Zimbabwe, um, sat at my, my parents' kitchen table. He said, Tiffany, what's your next step? And I told him, Dr. Chiva Order, I don't know. I don't know. And he said to me, there's a difference between a vocation and a calling. You can change your vocation. That's what you did to come back to school, but you can't walk away from a calling. And it was then and there that I decided that I would be an educator. And that's what these people did for me. They were brave educators who moved beyond what other people might think was appropriate conversations to really give me hope about how I could move forward in the best ways. And that's kind of what brings me to a pedagogy of hope. Currently, educators in the U.S. find themselves facing a number of problems and pandemics, including but not limited to COVID-19 and its consequences, political and economic crises, climate change, anti-Black racism, growing censorship, and deprofessionalizing um, of our field. This has all led to rising teacher attrition rates and substitute teacher shortages, um, and despair can seem relatively normal in this kind of context. In fact, in this kind of climate, it can become easy to become so fatigued and frustrated that you leave the profession altogether. And that's why I think it's extremely important right now for us to look to Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of Hope. Now, Pedagogy of Hope comes after probably his most famous book, with his, which is Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And Freire was very intentional that he create a work to follow up pedagogy of the oppressed because he didn't want to hit us hard and then just leave us there. He argued that it was always important for us to maintain hope. He said in 1970 that all education is political. Now, usually when I say that to teachers, given the current climate, it can become uncomfortable to deal with a sentence like that. All education is political, particularly now that critical race theory is in and among the news every time we turn it on and censorship of different books and reading resources. Um, teachers find themselves feeling bullied into silence. 
And it's important that we return to someone like Paulo Freire, who was born in Brazil in 1921 and trained in the field of literacy. He worked in literacy campaigns there in Brazil in the 1970s, I'm sorry, in the 1960s, and again when he returns to the country in the 1980s. Um, it's important to return to him because again, Freire's main point was that education is political. He did not run from that. Um, he undertook what can be understood as a revolutionary stance to education. And it reminds me of a Lerone Bennett quote. Lerone Bennett says, in an oppressive system, one is either an oppressor or a revolutionary. And I think Paulo Freire was a revolutionary. Much like culturally relevant pedagogy, a pedagogy of hope requires that teachers believe in their learners' potential. If there is no trust in a student's capacity for learning, there can be no hope that education can ever lead to revolutionary improvement of a community or society. And so we're going to talk about the pedagogy of hope and its anti-silencing work. It lies in community. Pedagogy of hope requires that we teachers see ourselves as part of a community and that we see our community as capable of collaborative and innovative problem solving to face the social ills that we currently face. Thus, among the purposes of schooling is an effort to privilege experiential knowledge and expertise. Now, as we go into talking a bit about a pedagogy of hope, I think it's important for us to remember as Donald Machado reminds us, uh, that Freire's goal in the creation of his pedagogies, pedagogy of oppressed and pedagogy of hope, um, that it was less about creating a formal methodology for education, so much as he was presenting a lens through which we could approach education as innately political and possibly liberatory. Again, Freire saw education as a revolutionary act, and we will discuss pedagogy of hope in this way. I want to start by just giving um, us a description of some of the characteristics that are embedded within the framework or the lens of the pedagogy of hope. But I want to start with a statement by Gannon. Um, he says that teaching is a radical act of hope. And again, given the current climate, I think many of us, if we're not feeling it ourselves, we know people who are feeling overwhelmed with education as a whole right now. Both parents who are dealing with the effects on learners and as teachers and the effects that we experience on us. Um, it's important to turn to the pedagogy of hope for a different way of understanding education. Now, one of the first key characteristics of a pedagogy of hope is that nestled within it is this core belief that there has to be trust and unity among both the teachers and the students. You must continuously, as a teacher seeking to implement the pedagogy of hope, ensure that you're not creating a false binary between yourself and your students. In a pedagogy of hope, all members of the learning community have something to contribute to the learning process. After all, as Bell Hooks tells us, the classroom is a communal space. And any effort where the teacher becomes the expert in the room and is expected to deposit knowledge into the head of a learner, then one is creating a dehumanization process by which the learners are um, subconsciously situating themselves as passive um, participants in the learning process. And I know that many of us who are trained as educators know that the last thing we want is for our students to feel passive in a classroom. They usually get distracted at that point and the learning is no longer relevant. And so trust and unity are some of the most important things as we move forward in um, a pedagogy of hope. And I'll just quote Freire here where he says, the starting point for organizing the protect program content of education or political action must be the present existential concrete situation reflecting the aspirations of the people. Now, what Freire is saying is that even in the classroom, we should allow our students some um, choice that they should have a, a say in what they're learning, how they're learning it, um, so on and so forth. So that's a key component of a pedagogy of hope. The second key component in a pedagogy of hope is that it's based on dialogue. Now, Paulo Freire uh, was very critical of what he called the banking model of education. And the banking model tends to, again, the teacher is seen as the expert in the room. 
standards are established by people in power. Um, and the teacher is making deposits of knowledge into the empty uh, accounts of students. And the banking model of education is something that Freire criticized throughout his career. In his explanation of both the pedagogy of hope and pedagogy of the oppressed, he argued that banking education is education that centers the knowledge of the dominant group and deposits that knowledge in students that are expected to passively accept it. And that that um, kind of education is made possible by hegemonic language that supports the oppression of marginalized people. This exchange where the teacher is the one holding the knowledge and the student is passively um, consuming it, that exchange creates a dependency among the learning population that leads to a lack of critical reflection and awareness about the power structures that shape their lived experiences. In other words, banking, the banking model of education sets up a scenario where schooling is a process by which the status quo is maintained. So people in power are creating standards. They're delivering them to teachers who may themselves be oppressed and teachers are making deposits into students in such a way that students accept their oppression as normative. Um, what the pedagogy of hope allows is for students and their teachers to move beyond that kind of narrative education where reality is treated as a permanent feature um, to another kind of consideration where one's agency is privileged, all right? So students no longer take that passive position. Dialogic education, because it starts with the necessary consideration of who the students are, how they feel about their lived realities and what they think about their lived realities. Um, the learning experience then is co-created with the teacher. Dialogue is a component of becoming human in a system that profits from dehumanization. By accurately naming the world together, teachers and learners both engage in using the word to give meaning and new structure to the world. This is what Prairie talks about as being revolutionary. So if we're co-creating language to describe the word together, the world together, excuse me, then we can imagine a different thing. Octavia Butler says, um, there, you can't have what you cannot see. In other words, if you don't dream it, it can't ever come to pass. And so that's a little bit of what Freire is saying here. If students aren't participating with their teachers to imagine things differently, then the last thing they can do is create different for themselves. Now, Freire gives us an example of this. Um, when he came out with Pedagogy of, the, of Hope, excuse me, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, one of the chief criticisms of the work came from feminists who said that Freire centered manness, maleness, patriarchy too much in his work. Rather than defending himself against it, Freire uh, entered into exchanges and conversations with other scholars. Bell Hooks talks about how warmly Freire engaged her ideas and that she saw the tendency in him to be patriarchal shift over the trajectory of his career. In this way, Freire modeled the kind of dialogue that could shift one's understandings and behaviors and create a new reality. So within the pedagogical framework, communication is not shaped by the dominant group, but it's deliberate co-creation among the people. In this way, students' contributions aren't just tolerated. So we're not just asking students to talk to us. We're also using that information and we're seeking it out and we're encouraging those conversations. Freire argued that dialogue could not exist without hope. Now, the third one um, in this is critical awareness. Freire describes critical awareness um, as essential to the pedagogy of hope because it requires that people are intending to look at social structures around them and see how it shapes their existence. As teachers to undergo purposeful reflection, is in an aim to teach well. So that's why we do reflection. A lot of us talk about being a reflective practitioner, but it's important that we remember that we're not only reflecting on the work that we do within the classroom with our students, that we also reflect about the context that shapes the work we do within that um, context. At the core of this kind of reflection is a question of, for whom are we as teachers and learners responsible?
Freire called this pro process problematization. So one of the examples I give to my students when we talk about this is um, many of us tend to teach the way we've been taught and we expect that everyone has similar learning experiences to our own. And so if students don't understand that, we may tell them as homework, go home and Google this. Well, I'm here in rural Southwest Georgia and the internet is not that readily available outside of businesses and institutions like the university. So it's not always easy for my learners to go home and Google something. As a teacher, it's important that I reflect upon that and its implications for my classroom but I also think about its implications for my students' lived lives beyond the classroom. This is the kind of problematization that Freire is talking about. It's not limited to academic subjects alone, but that we're thinking about our students' lived existence and how we can advocate for them outside of that. And not only advocate for them, but help them see their own agency for advocating for themselves. Now, this kind of reflection is only one part of what uh, Freire is arguing for. The second part is what he calls praxis, which is a simultaneous reflection and action. For Freire, it didn't make sense to reflect on one's social reality if one was not willing to act upon it. Therefore, the pedagogy of hope requires that the learning community not only reflect upon systems, but that they are also moved towards action. Thus, critical reflection is action according to the pedagogy of hope. There is no true word that is at not the same time a praxis. And that's a quote by Freire. Through this kind of reflection coupled with action, transformation is possible. But transformation is not given birth to through thought alone. So for teachers who think I've reflected upon this thing and I'm gonna, um, I've done my reflective piece, but has not moved towards enacting the, the consequences of that thinking, then they're not practicing praxis. Only interaction between knowledge and action is capable of transforming life. Um, you can't just think about power in a classroom without thinking about the actions that we can take to shift the power dynamics within that classroom. Finally, the pedagogy of hope has built into it the deliberate use of language. We talked about this a little bit with hegemony. The deliberate use of language within the pedagogy of hope rests on the fundamental belief that unity born from dialogue cannot occur without praxis. So it's a coming together of all of these key characteristics. Dominant discourse and the use of, it, of hegemonic language frequently disguise the role that they play in establishing a standard of what is considered neutral. And so right now, particularly in the educational um, fields, we see a lot of people playing with language, naming things critical race theory when that's not really what they're, they're describing. So we see how language becomes a game. It becomes a pawn through which other games are played. So those are some of the key characteristics of a pedagogy of hope. But I wanted to talk about what that might mean in terms of our classroom. If we want to implement a pedagogical um, framework for hope, then there has to be an unapologetic emphasis on the democratization of schooling. We can't pretend that education is not political. It depends also on dialogic educational practices. This requires a lot of humility on the educator's part. You can't be the expert of everything. And some of our students come to us knowing a whole lot more about things that we've never experienced. We have to be critically reflective and analytical of the broader society and our roles that we play in shaping that. We need to be open and ready to receive community engaged learning. We have to have egalitarian approaches to teaching and learning where there is no hierarchy of power. Again, that requires a, a level of humility among educators that we see ourselves as so confident and so um, prepared that it is okay for us not to be the expert at any given point. It involves a conscious deliberate use of language as a tool for inclusion. Now, I see a lot of people complaining about recognizing different pronouns for different individuals as problematic, but that would be among the first steps that Freire would argue is important to practicing a pedagogy of hope. 
because it's about the conscious, deliberate use of how we use language and what we do with language to either make a situation more inclusive or where we're marginalizing other people. And finally, as educators, although it's extremely difficult, in order to practice the pedagogy of hope, we have to believe, we have to have belief that things can get better. And so when we talk about classroom implications, it really falls into two separate categories, um, in my opinion. And one is that as teachers individually, we are reflective about our individual feelings and emotions. This is where I think all educators should have a journal. It could be analog or digital. Um, I am big on OTTR, Otter, if any of you have heard of that. Um, one of my colleagues taught me about it, but it does transcription. You get 600 minutes a month for free. That's also important for those of us that do research. And you can speak into your phone it records, it has an audio recording, but it also turns it to text. So having a journal where we're reflecting on things that are happening to us individually, um, I think is a good part of practicing a pedagogy of hope and having the analog journal or um, the digital journal is useful for that. Now, here's the thing about journaling. It almost doesn't mean anything if you never revisit what you've written. So taking time to go back and seriously reflect upon your ideas, see what your patterns are, that kind of thing is important. I think it's also important for a teacher, when we talk about culturally responsive strategies, we have to recognize that the use of culture can either be oppressive or liberatory. If we're only, as James Banks criticized uh, us, if we're only using culture for heroes and holidays, and that's something we need to reflect on because we're taking a stance where our culture matters, but the, the culture of other people is just decorative. And so part of our reflection has to be on how we're understanding culture, how we're using it in the classroom. The other kind of thing that I think teachers need to do is to ensure um, that they're taking care of themselves. Again, all of this is necessary because of the climate that we're in and the low morale that many educators are facing, no matter what level they're in or position right now, I think we're all feeling like every day is a Monday. Um, when we use these other critical pedagogies, it's important that teachers be seriously committed to their own well-being as well as that of their learners. When people talk about Paulo Freire, other scholars that knew him, they always describe him as warm, ready for conversation, enjoying good meals and good food and laughter. His tendency towards dialogue reflects his openness to critique and correction. And that comes from someone who feels relatively good about themselves. Freire argued that hope was best born from love. And that's the kind of revolutionary work we have to take. Now, as we understand that all of us are in this stressful environment, it's extremely um, important that we take care of our own joy and well-being. We talk a lot about social emotional learning, SEL in the classrooms, um, and seldom, it, it gets debated, but it, what does not get debated is its positive contributions to student well-being and academic achievement. Now, some people say it's not worth it, but there are few that can actually discount its importance in contributing to student well-being and academic achievement. What we seldom discuss, however, is the impact of teachers' social emotional learning on classroom learning. And I think for future research, we have to pay more attention to how teachers' emotions and their social emotional well being shape the classroom experience for their learners. Bell Hooks wrote this in 1994. I want to read it to you because it sounds like she wrote it yesterday. It says, More than ever before in recent history of this nation, Educators are compelled to confront the biases that have shaped teaching practices in our society and to create new ways of knowing, different strategies for the sharing of knowledge. We cannot address this crisis if progressive critical thinkers and social critics act as though teaching is not a subject worthy of our regard. Um, and that's why I wanted to share information about the pedagogy of hope with you today. Um, pedagogy of hope reminds us that hope is not a passive process. Having hope doesn't always feel good. It includes thinking about things that make our tummies tight, um, that make our faces hot, that make us nervous to speak out in public. 
But I want to remind us that if one does not operate in hope, change is almost impossible. And so that finishes, it concludes my presentation. And I wanted to leave room for dialogue. We can't talk about a pedagogy of hope and not leave space and capacity for us to really have an honest exchange about uh, the framework, how it can be used, the things that um, Freire saw as important to education. I, I want to also say this before I turn it completely over and we do the questions and answers. Um, it's extremely important that we remember that Freire's um, modeling of his educational practices was global in nature. He wasn't concerned with one context devoid of others, but he always thought about how it affected the global world, the global South, the global North, all of us together. And so as we have our conversations, I think it's interesting that we um, give details from our individual context, but we think about implications that it has for all of us wherever we are. And so Kim, I'll ask you if you will help facilitate the Q&A, if there are any questions at this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Pogue. Um, if you have questions and wanna open up the dialogue, we would love for you to use the chat um, to be able to do that. So we'll take a couple seconds for folks to start entering in their questions in the chat. And while we wait, um, one of the things that I think, interestingly, when I've done workshops on um, social emotional learning, what tends to happen is if I say education is political and ask folks to tell me how they feel, you know, we get a good response. So if you don't have anything else to chat about, I'll ask you uh, to think about, to reflect on what is it, what do you hear when you hear me say education is political and neutrality is something only some of us have the luxury of pretending to be. Okay, an example of a pedagogical of hope assignment. Um, journaling would be one of those really good assignments to have students do an activity and then tell you what the activity was like, what the language made them feel. Um, all of those things have them reflect on what does the broader power structure say about this thing. Um, for example, one of the, the what I've done before is take a Thanksgiving lesson plan. You just go on Teachers Pay Teachers or Pinterest and students find their own Thanksgiving lesson plans. And then we, you know, we evaluate it based on rubrics that are aligned with NTAS and lesson plans that seemingly are fine when we start applying a pedagogy of hope may seem to be a little bit different because now we're looking at how language is used. Right? Are we calling them Native Americans? Are we calling them Indians? Are we calling them First Nations people? What might those things mean to us? Are we saying that Native Americans just gave the, give, gave the pilgrims food to eat? What does that say to us? How are we engaging that? Um, there's another assignment. John Henry Clark wrote, wrote about this a lot, was putting Columbus on trial every Columbus day. And so he never, um, came down personally on either side of should we celebrate Columbus Day, what he would do is provide primary source documents to his students and allow them to have a case, create a case around Christopher Columbus and how he's represented in history. And therefore teachers, um, excuse me, students are learning to evaluate things based on their own merit, but also look at how power dynamics may be shaping how we talk about certain things. How do you guide students through pedagogy of hope assignments while also being aware of trauma that many of that many students carry due to oppression? I think sometimes we, um, whether we take students through activities related to oppression or not, there will be trauma. And if we're talking about students who experience trauma as a result of inequitable power dynamics. It does not add to their trauma for them to recognize that this is not a personal attack, but this is how structures exist. I've always said it's extra unfair to black children. I'm speaking as someone who used to be a black child, so I'm not saying that other people don't have this experience. I'm, I'm speaking of what I know black children face. As a black child, I'm facing the stigma of racism, whether I've 
I'm able to have conversations about it or not. It is far better for me to understand that this has nothing to do with Tiffany Denise and everything to do with Tiffany Denise identified as a black person. Right? It takes some of that that I may be internalizing it and it helps spread it so that I'm looking at structures, right? So when we talk about trauma-informed education, I think it's extremely important. This is what Freire was talking about when he was talking about trust and unity. When we talk about trauma-informed education, we have to be extremely careful that we're not becoming the savior for these children and that we're not assuming that they can't handle certain conversations. They are members, many of our learners are members of marginalized populations, whether we discuss it or not. And so the guide them through a pedagogy of hope assignment tells them, hey, look at this, look at this, look at this. It does not tell them what to think, however. And I think that's where some of the criticism comes from. Um, you know, we hear, I wanna also say this because it's my pet peeve. Right now, one of the criticisms about the critical race theory uh, conversation is, it makes white children uncomfortable. When you make that argument, what you're doing is dehumanizing children who aren't white. Because you're saying these white children's feelings matter more than how the other class students in the class may be affected, right? That wouldn't even be a conversation. And that's that hegemonic use of language that we're using the language. And the language is saying something very clear to people who listen well but we may not understand it as such. So modeling the behavior for students and being able to talk them through will not add to their trauma. Children are very, um, they're very aware. Any parent will tell you that. Children are very aware. They see a whole lot more than we think they do. And so to help them navigate the thinking process around what they observe, I think is much healthier than adding to silence around what they observe. Thank you for that question. Anyone else? And while we wait, I wanted to say something about this idea that education should not be political. Um, education has always been political, right? Thomas Jefferson argued um, that the purpose of education was to create an informed citizen. So we've always understood education as um, political, even when we talk about it being a public good. One of the reasons it's a public good is so that you have a population capable of making democratic decisions in an informed way. And so I don't understand this, um, well, I do understand it, <laughs> but I, I don't understand our response to this, um, this play on language to get us to try to be as neutral as possible. We don't gain from that. Neutrality is never one. I'm from the South, so pardon me for using a biblical reference, but I think it fits here. Uh, even God said, if you lukewarm, I'll spew thee from my mouth. That there is no room for neutrality in a world like we live in now. That we have to continue to preserve education as a public good that benefits not only those in power, not only those with money, but all of our students, all of our learners. So I wanted to, um, in light of uh, no more questions right now, I wanted to uh, say that when teachers are undergoing this uh, reflection, which Paulo, Paulo Freire says is, is essential to action, like we should be thinking before we act in any way, um, that it has to include the thinking of our own morals and values. What things do we think are important? And how does that get represented in the classroom? I want to go back to this hegemonic language thing because it's one of my favorite, hegemony is my favorite word. <laughs> Let me just say that. But I remember um, that same mentor I told you about, uh, his pet peeve was when we were planning every year at Fort Valley while he was the director of the African World Studies Institute, we had an African World Film Festival. And I remember being in planning meetings. Now, the first time it happened, I didn't know what was about to happen. Dr. Shuja was very quiet, very unassuming, still is very quiet, very unassuming. And um, it was the, one of the few times I, I've ever seen him raise his voice a little bit. And that was because someone said, are we going to serve continental breakfast? And I remember Shuja just, he kind of hit the table and he said, continent, continental breakfast, which one? 
That's how language gets used often in such a way that it normalizes the circumstances of one given group of people. And it becomes so normalized that we never question it. Nobody ever questions what continent when we talk about continental breakfast. But his point was, if we're talking about a film festival that's going to sponsor film, films from throughout the African world, we need to understand there are other countries that don't eat what we eat for breakfast that's continental, right? So thinking through how we use language like that, mommy and daddy on letters going home. That's the hegemonic use of language, right? When most of the characters in your book uh, come from a, have a heterosexual relationship, that's hegemony. And we have to be willing to confront that. We, we can't be so uncomfortable about, well, if I learned that, you should learn it too. That's not how the world changes. When we accept things on face value without being willing to unpack it and to be critical about it, then nothing ever changes. Uh, Shuja, actually, there is a book he wrote called Too Much Schooling, Too Little Education. And his argument was, if students aren't thinking in this way, then what is happening is schooling, not education because schooling maintains status quo. In, in fact, Lisa Delpit said, US public schools teach students to aspire to white middle-class values, right? And we never question whose values are being taught, whose morals and values. But this reflection piece would help us unpack that a little bit. Whose morals and values am I teaching here? And, I, and I'm gonna give you all what I give my students. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some teacher wait time because I want us to have a conversation. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. It's important that we challenge narrative through reflection and questions. And again, you know, the criticism is that we're telling students how to think. This is not the case. We're telling students to think, and that's a difference, right? I'm going to ask you questions. I'm going to give you access to resource materials, primary resource documents. I want you to make the decision for yourself. I'm not going to argue with you about the decision you come to, but let's walk through the process of what it's like to think deeply. You know, I don't know if many of you have this experience, but I do, of when I'm dealing with freshmen, I'll ask them, you know, read this sentence. They read the sentence, okay? So there's not a fluency issue. They can read the sentence. And then I say, what do you think? They're crickets, right? They're crickets because they don't know me yet. They don't know the climate and culture of the school yet. And so they're quiet when they're asked, what do you think? And I, I let it be an uncomfortable quiet for a while, right? And then I explain to them, you know, most of your life, someone has put the right answer among three other choices in front of you. And so you're looking to find which one I want you to say. I don't have a right answer for you. I just want you to give me an answer, right? So many of them have been conditioned to look for a right answer among a, a group of choices. That, that's not thinking. And I, as educators, we have to push them towards learning to think, not what to think. Yes, yes, yes. You know, part of this assault on critical race theory, I tell my students, and I'll, I'll give you this piece of advice if you've not thought about it, whenever I'm confronted with that, about whether or not we're teaching teachers to teach critical race theory, I always ask the person to find it in the standards. As professional educators, as many of us, you know, have worked in public schools, we know we teach the standards. And I don't know of a single state that has critical race theory in its standards. We're not teaching it. So I don't engage in that conversation because most of the people who will criticize you can't explain what it is. So I play the game with you. I'm completely ignorant to it. Can you show me in the standards where, so I know what class to look at? It's not there. So there, I'm not getting into that with you because again, that's the use of language. You're being distracted by this moniker that you know nothing about. <laughs> it has nothing to do with almost anything you mean, I promise. Or to name at least one CRT scholar. Exactly, exactly. Very much so, very much so. And I think uh, that it's important for us to, um, and I, I know how it feels, I know how it feels. I think it's important for us to allow our learners to see us struggle with it, right? That we are, um, 
I don't, I don't think I said this, so let me say it. When Freire is talking about critical awareness and reflection, he's talking about social reflection. So not only are you practicing some individualized reflection on your own morals and values and how you shape the system of power, so on and so forth, but that actually you're also participating in group reflection around these issues. I, as teachers, sometimes we make it seem like we figured it all out and that adds to our stress because we, we think we have to perform as if we're not confused too. I let my students know right now, most days feels like a Monday. I'm tired. And I'm not arguing with you about CRT and I know you all know what you're talking about. You know, so we have those kinds of conversations and I'm transparent with them about here is how I'm thinking about it. Here's how I'm responding. Does that response work? What do, what do you say? And why are we saying these things? And what has, you know, what has been your experience? Sometimes as teacher educators in particular, um, we may not feel comfortable seeming uncertain, but I think that's an important part of preparation for the field because they're going to feel uncertain. <laughs> it doesn't matter how long you've done this, you're going to feel uncertain. And to help them know that they go into it and that's normal, that's normal. And while I'm on that point, let me tell you what else is normal. I was listening to a podcast the other morning and uh, the host was saying he had spoken to a Navy SEAL. And he said it was the first time he's ever, you know, spoken to someone at that level of the military. And it was just very interesting. And he was asking the guy, you know, what, what's, the, what's the basics of your training? And the SEAL said to him, we are taught to plan very well. We're taught to plan very well to the detail. What's the climate like? What's the wind going to be like? Or do I have all of my resources? How long can I be there before some alarm goes off? You know, you, you plan all the details and contingencies to those, those details. He said, but the other part of our training is that plan is going to hell as soon as we land. And I think it's important as teacher educators that we do the same thing, that we teach our, our teachers how to plan, how to con how Use the NTAS standards, right? Or if you're still doing NTPA, how do you create a lesson plan that includes an engaging hook that keeps your, it's differentiated. Your assessment is aligned with your objectives and your standards and your outcomes. And you, you've been clear and you've you know, been concise and you, your time and your transitions, you got a, the, the best uh, use of the space, so on and so forth. So they're creating these wonderful plans. But we also have to let them know, you're gonna get punched in the face as soon as class starts. What are you gonna happen when the plan goes to hell, right? So when, we have, when we're having these reflective processes, we have to be transparent with them about how it felt when I had this presentation plan and my slides didn't work and what I had to do because my slides weren't working or I forgot this essential element for this lab I wanted to do. What am I gonna do with my, my class for 50 minutes? You know, I, I think sometimes we're so conditioned to perform excellence that we forget that real excellence includes some innovation and, and some adaptation, right? Um, I don't know where that came from. I just wanted to add that part in. <laughs> so we're wrapping up on time. Um, Kim, I know we wanted to leave some time at the end. Are there any other questions or comments? I was also a teacher and did a lot of wait time in my day with my eighth graders. So we can, we will wait just one a couple more seconds here if there are any more questions and then we'll close up. Okay, we gave our wait time, I think appropriately, Dr. Pogue. Thank you so much, Dr. Pogue, for your time with us today and the Branchhead community for your attendance um, and participation in today's Nuts and Bolts webinar. Um, I, in the chat, you're gonna see our upcoming events at Branch Ed. We would love to see you at an upcoming event um, in the near future. Um, and we would love to get some feedback on this webinar um, for future webinars. So I'm going to launch a poll right now. You should see it pop up on your screen. It's just one question. If you can answer it for us, we'll use this um, for feedback for future webinars. Great. I see y'all taking it live. Thank you so much. And last but not least, we will be sending out a recording to everyone. So you'll be able to watch and rewatch all of the um, pieces and nuggets of information that Dr. Pogue has shared with us today. Just thank you so much for your time today. And um, we've really enjoyed learning from you. Thanks everyone. <laughs>